first and foremost, for your dad, happy Father's Day. Glad you're here. Um, thank you for the many ways in which you serve your families. Um, since it is Father's Day, you're going to take a little bit of a break from Genesis to look at the scriptures with the aim of helping dads. Um, but because God's word is God's word, it's and you'll see the message is going to be a little bit different. It's not the way I'd normally preach through the Bible, nor the way I'd advocate for someone to preach through the Bible on a weekly basis. But we're going to hop around the scriptures. I'm going to let the scriptures do most of the work. We're going to look at a lot of scripture. If you have a Bible, it would be helpful to have because we're going to be turning all over the place. Um, but before we do anything else, let's pray. Ask the Lord to bless our time in his word. So bow your heads with me, please. Father, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you for being the merciful Father that you are. Lord, your, your fatherhood, you being that perfectly perfect heavenly Father, is it's such good news for us, Lord. You never fail us like an earthly father does. You, your love, your compassion, your discipline, your care. Lord, it is stunning to those of us who know it, who have experienced it through faith in Christ. And I pray that as we look at your character this morning, Father, that that your glory would just shine brightly and that we who know you through faith in Jesus would be encouraged, built up, transformed, strengthened. Lord, may our souls be fed well by gazing on your glory this morning. Lord, we gather together this morning uh, a people in desperate need one reason this message is so helpful is that it reminds us uh, that you are a God who truly cares about us in our need and not just big needs, every need. Because through faith in Christ, we're your children. Lord, what a precious, helpful, timely reminder. So gathering as your children who need you for so many things, need you for just physical strength to do the daily tasks that you've entrusted us with, emotional strength to walk through the difficulties of life, Lord, mental strength when our minds are going in a million different directions, help in our relationships because you know better than anyone else that we are sinful and stumble often with our words, sharp words toward a friend or a spouse or a family member. Lord, so many needs and yet we as your children through faith in Christ, gather under your wings and take refuge and shelter and seek your help. And we seek it knowing that you graciously give it. So Lord, meet us in our needs. May you take your living word and Lord, speak to us as only you can through it. Meet us where we are and give us what we need. What we need to know you and love you and follow you. Father, we pray for Redeeming Grace Fellowship that you continue to help us to be faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ as you've revealed it in Scripture. Lord, not to swerve to the left or to the right, but that our only boast would be Jesus Christ and Him crucified risen from the dead, Savior of sinners by faith alone. 
Lord, let us cling fast to your gospel that is the power of salvation for all who believe. Let us cling to your word. Lord, preserve us. Lord, may we not fall into error about what your word teaches, but by your spirit, guide us to be faithful. And Lord, may you do that not only for redeeming grace, but for the other churches in this area. Help us to be faithful to what you have said. And by your spirit, empower us to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, please work now in the next 30 minutes or so. May your spirit guide and direct it all for the good of your people, for the glory of your name. And it's in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ's name, that we pray all these things. Amen strategy is really simple this morning. We're going to look to God, we're going to look at his gospel, and then we're going to see how the gospel transformation experienced by believers gets lived out in our lives. And while my words will tend to shine the spotlight on fathers this morning, the truths we're going to look at in scripture, as I've said, they're applicable to all believers. And I trust that you'll see that in God's word. So that being said, we're going to begin our time by looking at God and his gospel. And to do that, I want to unpack this truth. So this is going to be the foundational truth that all the other ones that we look at hinge on. Our Heavenly Father adopts us as his children. Our Heavenly Father adopts us as his children. And by the word us, in that statement, I don't intend to communicate that God the Father adopts every single person without exception as his child. You've probably heard that a number of times. We're all God's children. There is a sense in which that is true and that God is the creator of all people. So if that's the sense in which you mean it, then okay. And you can probably find a scriptural warrant for saying such things. Ephesians 3, perhaps. God is the father of all the families of the earth. But that's not what most people mean by it. God the Father does not adopt every single person without exception as his child. That's not what scripture reveals to us. He adopts only those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He adopts those who come to him through faith. And his son. When our first father Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, he plunged the whole world into death and decay, including all of his descendants, which includes you and me. And now when we are born into this world, we are not only sinful, but we are separated from God, alienated from him, not in a relationship with him, not his children. That's why Jesus could look at the Jews during his earthly ministry who were rejecting him, Jews who worshipped Yahweh, the one true and living God, his father, at least with their lips. He looked at them and said, God is not your father. Your father is the devil. If God were your father, you would love me, Jesus said. So that picture, pretty dismal and bleak, that picture of sinful humanity But what we learn from the Bible is that God loves the world. God loves those who are alienated from him, those who have rebelled against him. And he has made a way to rescue and redeem sinners from death and hell, from eternal separation from him. He has made a way to not only reconcile us to himself, but to actually adopt us into his family. To make us his children. To make us co-heirs with Jesus. That's how scripture describes believers in Philippians. You are a co-heir with the Lord Jesus himself. If you're united to Christ by faith. And the way sinners come to experience this adoption as sons and daughters of God is, just as I just mentioned, faith in the Lord Jesus and his gospel work. Faith in him, his death on the cross in our place, and his resurrection from the dead. 
Christ lived that perfect life of obedience to God's law. He died as the spotless lamb of God on the cross who takes away the sins of the world, John the Baptist proclaimed. He paid our penalty before God in full. And then he defeated death, the ultimate penalty for our sin. The wages of sin is death. He defeated death by rising from the grave, securing our resurrection, the glorious final aspect of our salvation that we now anticipate with great joy and eagerness. Now, when we dive deeper into the doctrine of adoption, this teaching that God adopts believers into his family, we discover that God carries out this work of adoption with a purpose. And the purpose is to conform us into his image. That's the purpose linked with adoption when you see this teaching throughout the New Testament. God's goal in adopting us is to make us more like him. Let me show you this in a couple different places. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he begins by teaching the church the doctrine of adoption among many other things in Ephesians 1. He writes in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 that God the Father in love predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. And in that very chapter you'll find linked to that that he has chosen us in Christ, prepared us for adoption so that we would be holy and blameless. In other words, like him. After teaching us in Ephesians 1 that he has adopted us to himself as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, he starts unpacking what it means to be his children. And we find a summary statement of that truth in Ephesians 5 verse 1 where Paul writes, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. There it is. Adopted as sons. Why? To imitate our father. There's a lot more to it than that, but that is a big part of what it means to be adopted. Why God has adopted us. That we might reflect his image. Using that language of image and likeness, Paul writes a similar statement in Ephesians 4, 23 through 24, where we learn that believers in Christ are to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. God the Father adopted us as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ so that we could imitate or reflect or display his glory and character in the world. We see a very similar pattern in Paul's letter to the Romans. In Romans 8, 14 through 16, we learn that all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. There's that sonship. And that we did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And that the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So there's that adoption language. Then later in Romans 8, we learn that one of the reasons God the Father works all things together for good, for those who have been called to him through faith in Christ, those who have been adopted as sons and daughters, is that he predestined those whom he foreknew to be conformed to the image of his Son. God determined before the foundation of the world that the end goal or the end result of the people that he foreknew, predestined, called, and justified in Christ would be their glorification. Just a fancy word for making us completely into the image of Jesus, which will happen on the last day when he raises us from the dead. That means that God's end goal for us as believers, the end result of him adopting us calling us to himself through faith, declaring us righteous in Jesus, the end goal of that is that we would be completely conformed to the image of Jesus, the eternal Son of God, who is the exact representation of his Father and the radiance of his glory, Hebrews 1.3. In other words, God the Father chose his people in Christ and redeemed them through Christ so that they would reflect the image of Christ, which is essentially the image of himself. Now, The question you might be asking at this point is, what does any of this have to do with Father's Day? Because you said this was a Father's Day sermon at the beginning. 
If you're a father who is a believer in Jesus, it has everything to do with Father's Day because an earthly father who has been redeemed by God the Son, sealed by God the Spirit, and adopted by God the Father, the triune God's goal in making us his own is that we reflect his image in the world, including in our homes, that we might display the glory and character of our Father as we live out our roles as fathers. So, Again, while the passages that we're going to be examining, and this is why I wouldn't advocate someone preach this way every Sunday, the passages that we're going to look at, while they're extremely relevant for every believer, not just fathers, and while the primary purposes are not necessarily to teach us about parenting, per se, we're going to spend our time together looking at four characteristics of our Heavenly Father. That's what we're going to do, and we'll do so as beloved, adopted children in Christ who are called to imitate God our Father. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at the characteristics of God the Father as children who are called to imitate Him, children who are called to reflect, in some sense, that glory that we see of His. Okay? Here's the first characteristic. Our Heavenly Father shows compassion to His children. Our Heavenly Father shows compassion to His children. The psalmist writes in Psalm 103, verses 13 and 14, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear Him. For He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Here we see the psalmist drawing an analogy between an earthly father and his children and God and the believers in Israel. As an earthly father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who believe in him and follow him and stand in awe of who he is and walk in covenant faithfulness to him. And in verse 14, we see the psalmist, he gives a reason why the Lord does this. For or because the Lord knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. The eternal, infinite all-powerful God of the universe knows fully well that we are not like him, that we are not all-powerful, that we are but creatures, that we are weak and frail, that he has made us from the dust of the ground. And while God is certainly holy, a God of righteousness and justice, he's also a God of compassion who looks upon us knowing we are weak, knowing that we have limitations, knowing that our frame is but dust and that we are utterly dependent upon him as our creator. The Lord has compassion on those who fear him because he knows our frame and our great need of him. So as fathers who are in Christ and called to imitate our heavenly father as beloved adopted children, what can we learn from him and his character in this area? We can model the Lord's compassion for his weak, frail creatures by moving toward our children, our families, in grace, knowing that they're not perfect, that they are but dust, that they have weaknesses and limitations, and that they will fail. We see their shortcomings and weaknesses, but instead of coming down on them with only a mindset governed by justice or wrath or anger or something like that. Let us fathers walk beside our children and our families in an understanding, sympathetic way, in a way that doesn't ignore weaknesses, frailties, and sins, but rather in the midst of those weaknesses leads them to the throne of grace, knowing that our Father's grace is sufficient in our weaknesses. Concerning the throne of God's grace, the New Testament writer to the Hebrews writes this in Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Our Heavenly Father has compassion for His children. He cares for us in our weaknesses and through Christ 
our high priest, he sympathizes with us. Therefore, let us Christian fathers imitate him and reflect his glory and character in our lives by having compassion on our children and on our families, by leading them to the place where weak, frail, needy people can receive mercy and grace. Here's the second characteristic. Our Heavenly Father cares for His children. Our Heavenly Father cares for His children. One of the places we see the fatherly characteristics of God shine forth most brightly is in the Lord Jesus' teaching from the Sermon on the Mount. There, He very helpfully and clearly taught His disciples about our Heavenly Father and the care He displays for His children. A couple of passages from the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 6, Verses 25 through 33, the apostle records the following words of Christ. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, the king of Israel, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, the unbelievers, seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Just a little later in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7, verses 7 through 11, we read, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be open. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? It is just abundantly clear from those passages that our Heavenly Father cares for His creation. He cares for the birds of the air. And we see His care for the birds displayed in the way He feeds them. He cares for the lilies of the field and the grass And we see his care for these things displayed in the way he causes them to grow in beauty and splendor. So if God cares so much for temporary creatures like birds and frail aspects of his creation like grass that just burns up in a minute when it's thrown in the fire and gone forever, how much more does he care about eternal creatures? made in his very image and likeness, especially those who have been rescued, redeemed, and adopted as children through faith in Jesus. Moreover, if our children ask us fallen, sinful, earthly fathers for food, we give them food. Therefore, we can be confident that our Father in heaven, the one in whose image we are made, He will give us our daily bread. And often, other good gifts that we don't even need. That He just gives to us in His kindness. Our Heavenly Father knows what we need and He cares for us by providing for those needs. As His children, we are called to seek His kingdom and His righteousness and we are to seek Him in prayer asking for His provision. And as we do, He says, I'll take care of you. So as fathers, earthly fathers in Christ who are called to imitate our heavenly father who has adopted us, 
How can we reflect his image in this area? We earthly fathers can model the Lord's care for his people and imitate our heavenly fathers by simply caring for the various needs of our children and our families. Now, I don't want to be misunderstood to be saying that it is incumbent upon us earthly fathers to care for our families perfectly the way our heavenly father cares for us. That is, quite frankly, not going to happen in this fallen, sinful world. And the reasons for that are innumerable, really. We might experience the unforeseen loss of a job. We might be stricken by physical disability. We might experience some sort of injury that causes us to have severe surgery and we're laid up for weeks or months, even possibly years, recovering from it. Laying in a bed. We may even, God forbid, discover that we are terminally ill when we least expect it. 40, 45, 50, cancer, inoperable. So I'm not calling us earthly fathers to imitate our heavenly father by the way we care for our families in order to overwhelm men who are in difficult circumstances, to overwhelm them with unnecessary and even unwarranted guilt. But at the same time, when we take everything Scripture reveals to us about our roles and our call to imitate God as beloved, adopted children in Christ, it is clear that we ought to strive by His grace, by His power, to care for our children and our families insofar as we are able to do so. Now having said that, especially in our culture, we must know this. Caring for our children and our families like God cares for us does not necessarily mean buying them a really large house in a gated community or buying them a brand new car when they're 16 or making sure that they have the most fashionable, expensive clothing or only buying food from Whole Foods Market. That's not what it is. Caring for the needs of our children the way God compassionately, as we saw just a moment ago, cares for the needs of His, reflecting His image, might mean changing your kid's diaper when your wife's busy or when she's not busy. <laughs> that would probably be more compassionate. Giving a bath to your kid helping them get dressed, buying clothes for them, knowing that it doesn't matter whether they come from Gap or Goodwill, taking them out for ice cream on a hot day like today just because it's fun and they enjoy it, playing basketball with them even when you get home and you're tired and cranky after working all day, cooking dinner, feeding it to them if they need help. We care for the needs of our children like God when we, insofar as we are able, compassionately care for them. Holistically, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Just like our Heavenly Father cares for us. The care we give to our families is one of the means by which we point them to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who cares for his children, who cares for our children that we're caring for infinitely better than we ever could. So let's reflect his image in that way. Here's the third characteristic. Our Heavenly Father disciplines his children. Our Heavenly Father disciplines his children. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews teaches us about this aspect of God's character toward us who have been adopted through faith in Christ. 
Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 through 11. There he writes, Consider him, that's Jesus, considered him who endured such, or forgive me, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, this is a quote from Proverbs. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he, our heavenly father, disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now I'm keenly aware that entering the realm of disciplining children is extremely controversial and contentious. But my aim in going here is neither of those things. And I'm not here to advocate for a particular style or method of discipline. The point I want to draw out from this passage is simply what it communicates. Namely, that just as earthly fathers discipline their children, our Heavenly Father disciplines His children. And His children are those who believe on the Lord Jesus and have been adopted into His family. Now, as we think about discipline, we must think about both aspects of it. Because we tend to only see discipline as corrective discipline. Discipline isn't just a butt whipping or a time out for disobedience. There's also formative discipline. It trains and builds up. Think about the word discipleship. What we do is we follow Jesus as disciples. We're being disciplined by the Lord. Training ourselves in the ways of Christ. And the key point of the passage is that the goal of both corrective and formative discipline, whether that discipline is being carried out by an earthly father or our heavenly father, is not merely punishment or pain. Discipline of any kind is not pleasant. It isn't pleasurable to sit in the corner for 30 minutes instead of playing with toys. It isn't pleasurable to be spanked It isn't pleasurable to be given strenuous chores or having to help out with tough things around the house when you're a little kid. But the goal is always to see those who are disciplined built up, to see their character shaped in a positive way that will benefit them later in life rather than in a negative way that will only lead toward their detriment. The Lord disciplines His children so that we might grow in holiness and yield the fruit of the Spirit. He disciplines us to keep us on the path of righteousness when we're straying off of it. And in a similar way, we earthly fathers can imitate our Heavenly Father as His beloved children by modeling this kind of attitude in the way we discipline our kids, regardless of method or style. Since we care for our children and only want what is best for them, we don't want to see them settle into characteristics or lifestyles that will only bring them harm and trouble. This is the way a lot of the Proverbs talk. Just general truths, not any kind of guarantees or anything, but just ways that will generally profit and be helpful for living in a fallen world. When we discipline them, kids, in a formative way, we're trying to build character traits in them that will lead to them being successful in life, not success in a worldly sense, but success in the sense of interacting with others and living in a way that leads to good and honorable outcomes, particularly outcomes that honor the Lord. 
The same is true of corrective discipline. We correct our children when they do something wrong or unsafe in order to train them not to exhibit such behaviors. But for the believer in Christ, the discipline doesn't have merely a physical or earthly component to it. It isn't just about breaking earthly laws or being physically safe. As God's people, we exercise discipline, both corrective and formative, with a view toward the spiritual realm, with a view toward the spiritual well-being of our children. Not just that things would go well on earth. When they disobey us or do something wrong, we are given opportunities in those moments to point them to their need of forgiveness before God, to share the great mercy and grace of Christ, and to train them in paths of righteousness when, Lord willing, they are drawn to faith in Jesus by the Spirit of God. We earthly fathers imitate our heavenly Father and reflect His glory and character when we discipline our children in ways that both reveal their need for God's grace and in ways that foster an obedience, foster obedience to us and ultimately to the Lord. Fourth and final characteristic of God the Father that we're going to look at this morning is this. Our Heavenly Father loves His children. Our Heavenly Father loves His children. Now, we probably realize that each of the previous characteristics of God are ultimately expressions of His love. So it may sound kind of redundant after saying God has compassion for his children and cares for his children and disciplines his children, that he loves his children. But I want to conclude our time by clearly seeing not only that our Heavenly Father loves his children in a general way, but that Scripture repeatedly teaches us how he loves us. And by how, I mean the most important way that he loves us. The way that scripture most often emphasizes his love for us. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, the Apostle John writes, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. It is the love that God has for his elect people that drove him to make us his own, to make us his children, to bring us into his family. So here we find ourselves ending the same way we started. God's love for us is what compelled him to choose us and adopt us. And the way in which that fatherly love has been most clearly demonstrated and lavished upon us is through the cross work of his son, Jesus in the next chapter of his letter, the Apostle John elaborates on the love God has for his people. In 1 John 4, 7 through 10, he writes this, Beloved, you who are dearly loved by God, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the wrath-bearing sacrifice for our sins. Here's what we learn. God is love. He is the very epitome of love. And the way in which he, his love has been most clearly revealed to the world and given to his believing image bearers was by sending his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world to bear the wrath and justice that we deserve. And we know that he did that on the cross. And he did it so that we might be forgiven of our sins, reconciled to God the Father, and granted eternal life, that we might live through him. And what is most remarkable about the Apostle John's description of our Heavenly Father's love is this. He reminds us that God demonstrated this kind of love for us even though we did not love him first. 
In Romans 5, Paul teaches the same thing this way. God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Same thing, chapter 5, Romans. He died for us for the ungodly. You weren't godly when Christ died for you, when he shed his blood for you. Romans 5 says, he died for us while we were enemies of God. while we were in rebellion against him, instead of leaving this world to wallow and drown in sin and darkness, he loved the world. And as Jesus taught Nicodemus in John 3.16, our Heavenly Father loved the world in this way that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Father's love is matchless, immeasurable, and unfailing, and it is displayed most clearly and experienced most fully in and through the person and work of his son, Jesus. Now, when it comes to us earthly fathers seeking to imitate our heavenly father's beloved children, this obviously is something we can't imitate. We can't give either ourselves or our sons as a means of atoning for the sins of others. However, we can imitate the love of God in two ways. First, we know from Ephesians 5 that husbands are called to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So with that biblical teaching or principle in mind, we can imitate the love of God for our children and for our families by following Christ's example of loving them with a sacrificial, selfless, servant-like love, a cross-like love. But secondly, while we should certainly love our children and families like Christ, we must not only show God's love for them with our actions, but teach them God's love with our words. That is to say, we are called to love our families like Christ, like God loves us, but we are also called to love our families by leading them to Christ. By showing them how he has loved us. By teaching them with our words how he has loved us. Therefore, as earthly fathers, we can imitate our heavenly father by allowing the love we have for our children and for our families to drive us toward caring deeply about their eternal souls and doing everything in our power by the grace of God, to bring them into an experience of the love God has for image bearers in Christ Jesus our Lord. We love them like God, but we also love them by giving them God, by teaching them the gospel by which they too can be rescued, redeemed, and adopted into the Father's family. And when, Lord willing, they come to experience that saving love of God through faith in Jesus, we continue to constantly remind our children and our families just how great his love for us in Christ truly is. Our Heavenly Father has compassion on his children. He cares for the needs of his children. He disciplines his children for the sake of obedience and holiness. And he loves his children, a love that is seen most clearly by looking at the cross of his son. Therefore, having experienced the love of God through faith in Christ, I pray that God will continually empower his beloved children to imitate him, to reflect his image, to reveal his character, and to display his glory to our children, to our families, and to this world in which we live.